you know, it's kind of funny. I, I took a tour of the campus and, you know, like they're, we're walking around talking about the dorms and all that stuff. And there's retention ponds on the campus. And I, mm. I saw some mullet jumping out of the, of the retention pond. It's, you know, landlocked. And like, I asked the guy, like, what's the deal? Is Why is there a mullet in here? And as soon as I asked him, a tarpon came up and blasted the mullet. And the mullet all showered. And I was like, there's tarpon <laughs> on campus. Oh, my God. So that was like, I mean, I wanted to study marine science anyway, but that was the deciding factor. And I could fish for tarpon all day on in between class or whatever. And wow. snow, you know? so that was really cool. Um, but got, you know, got the Marine science degree and I had a goal. They asked you when you're a freshman of, you know, where do you see yourself in 10 years? And I said, I wanted to be a professional fishing guide and I want to have my own fishing TV show. And I, I made it happen. I, I was the host of a show on NBC sports for four years and, and on, on the discovery channel as well. This is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Fascinating stories to amaze, encourage, and inspire you in fishing, fitness, and the outdoors. And we're brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee. I started this podcast as a way to connect with my friends, people that I admire and respect, and you. It has been a learning journey that's made me a better person, a better fisherman, a better father, and a better athlete. I'm so happy that you're on this journey with me, and I'd love to hear from you with show suggestions, guest suggestions, or questions. The best way to get a hold of me is through text. You can text 305-930-7346 for the fastest response, but if you prefer to email, you can send that to podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. That's a dedicated email address just for the show. If you like this show, you can show your support by posting about it on social media and tagging me. Text the link to a couple of friends that may also enjoy it and subscribe and leave a five-star review if you feel like I've earned it. The website is tomrollandpodcast.com, and that is where everything lives. All past shows, you can go and listen to any show. You can look up all the different shows that we've done, both the How To Tuesdays, the Full Links, and the Physical Fridays. They all live on tomrollandpodcast.com. And the social media is tom underscore Roland, R-O-W-L-A-N-D, on Instagram, or you can go to our big account, saltwater underscore experience. I hope to hear from you soon. So now let's get on to today's show. Well, I am Captain Tyler Capella, and this is the Tom Roland Podcast. Thanks for having me. Tyler, what's up, man? How are you? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. I'm uh, just got a couple of days off the water here. I've been going pretty like just going right after it, after I got back from Australia on the 10th uh, and re- jumped right into the charter business scene. And just like the fishing has actually been incredible here in Tampa Bay. I'm a, I'm a fishing guide out of uh, Tampa Bay, Florida here out of St. Pete, actually. Uh-huh. Um, been doing that for 14 years. But yeah, man, since I've ever since I've been back, um, the tarpon fishing has been insane. Like, we had a, yeah, we had a you week. I think back. that's uh, because of the hurricane or. Uh, yeah. It, ha- it has to have been. Um, so you know, in your I, opinion, like did, when you got back, you say you got back on the 10th and then when was the, when was the hurricane? So, yeah, man, I was, I was gone for that whole thing. And I was, you know, it was supposed to do a direct impact on St. Pete, um, like the early October. So like, I don't know, like the third or something like that, or, um, somewhere in there. Um, and I was just watching it from the other side of the world, like, oh my God, like what's going to happen to to my city? Like, it might I might not be able to, you know, do anything when I get back and just kind of helpless. My fiance evacuated to um, uh, Orlando, where my parents are, and you know, then it took the turn and and went into Fort Myers, and we have all seen what happened down there, um, which is pretty terrible. Uh, but you know, it spared St. Pete. All we had was just some wind damage and like a little, just minimal stuff. And the tide actually went out like seven feet, I think is what they said. We had a, a negative seven foot storm surge. So, yeah, I saw, um, um, Ed Walker had a, uh, had a video that went super viral, crazy. but I, uh, he was just walking out in Tampa Bay dry. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. And we've, we've seen the same kind of thing happen in, in the Everglades before with a hurricane where, um, Basically, Flamingo was just dry like that. It's crazy. crazy man. Yeah, it crazy. is crazy. But so, you know, when I got back, I was I kind of got back about a week or so, maybe even a little bit after it 
pass through. So the water had a chance to settle. I feel like the day that I got back and like was able to fish again, of course I was twisted sides sideways with jet lag. Like I've never been so jet lag. It was really like, they say going East is worse and man, it just hit. I was just upside down for a, a, like 10 days. Almost. It took me to get over, but just jump right back into chartering a day after I got home and <laughs> went out there to just check, you know, just kind of look around and see what was going on. The, I went out and blacked out my live well with giant Magnum white baits and the first spot that I went to, there was no bait or anything there, but I was marking tarpon on my side imaging. I'm like, oh, well, okay, like let's give this a shot. And threw a bunch of those white baits out and actually had the tarpon chummed up behind my boat. And from then on, like every single day after that, we were we whacked them. I, I think with that negative storm surge, it pulled a lot of those juvenile tarpon out of the any like the Manatee River, different rivers, and pulled them out near the mouth of the bay. And then we also had the big adult fish mixed in like the big migratory fish. I mean, I was seeing schools on the beach. Like it was June on the outgoing tides, like big schools plowing down the beach. I'm like, just like, what is happening? And we actually, we jumped 14 fish one day (laughs) on on a trip and then went out to a near shore reef. And it was absolutely stacked with like um, big Spanish bonita, some sharks in the first day. So after jumping all those tarp and we caught a 60 pound cobia, like out of the middle of nowhere. So that was just like, and it's, it was just, just going off ever, ever since. Basically. So, so in the 14 years that you've been guiding, what's your experience with, with hurricanes and, and how it affects the fishing? Well, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of variables, but it's, um, of course it, it once, a, you know, when it rolls through, it basically just shuffles the deck completely and just resets everything. Um, and once everything kind of once it's stirred when it's stirred up and all that it's not really that great fishing you know you can get a few fish here and there but they're kind of the fish are freaked out they've been tossed around they're moved they're on the move but then once it settles um it obviously moves stuff around a lot so it can be really good afterwards just like it was in this instance um but it just changes everything dramatically so uh changes the the bottom out there and it you know moves the water around so much and and then, of course, a big issue, which is already we're seeing down in Fort Myers, is the uh, there's a red tide that's popping up already once the salinity comes back up, um, which is has been a big issue on the West Coast here for the last, you know, yeah. 15, 20 years runoff and things like that. So, And so you think um, that has been like supercharged with the hurricane and all the water that was was um, was yeah, pushed out? I mean, I absolutely. I mean, you know, for years they've been saying that, you know, it's a naturally occurring thing Mm -hmm. and that is true. But when you take a match that is red tide and you pour a bunch of gasoline on it, which is the nutrients it feeds on from sewage and fertilizer runoff and all these other things that humans are introducing into our waterways, then it just turns into a raging inferno that spreads up and down the coast that would normally might be just a localized small thing. And that's kind of, I was, I don't know if you saw the stuff that I did on it last year at the red tide, but I was very vocal. I was kind of like the became the voice of the red tide resistance almost. Mm -hmm. Um, and just trying to get the actual information out there instead of, you know, of course the phosphate industries and things like that are, they want to keep that all hush hush, but, um, <laughs> so it was kind of, it got a little wild there last year, but yeah, there's, I mean, there was finally a scientific peer reviewed study by the university of Florida and some of their affiliates that said indeed that the nutrients that humans are introducing to our waterways are in fact supercharging the red tide. Yeah. Well, I mean, so that's, it seems like uh, it's almost like, okay, what's the simplest, what's the simplest, um, uh, reason that you could have something like that happen. It seems like, well, yeah, it seems like the the nutrients that we're putting into the water would, yeah. would accelerate the red tide. I mean, it doesn't seem like that's a huge jump. And, uh, but, but I guess, you know, it's hard to, to say that if there's no, no, you know, it's bro science until you get some, some real, sure. real science there, but that, that did come out last year is, is what you're saying that, that, that study from, from uh, university of Florida, was it? Yes. It, it, they did a six year study and it finally determined that it's, it's significantly um, 
you know, supercharges the red tide basically. Right. So they, they think they thought for a long time that there's a correlation between hurricanes and red tide. Cause for instance, hurricane Charlie back in what, 2005, mm-hmm. the next year we had a massive red tide, um, hurricane, uh, what Ur- so we had a tropical storm Ermine in the Gulf, which is 2015 or 16. The next year we had a red tide and Irma in 17, 18, we had a massive red tide. Um, so they think that it might stir that organism up off the bottom with mm-hmm. a big wave action. So it puts it into the water column, but then it interacts with the nutrients that we're putting into the waterways and boom. And then that's what, that's kind of the, the way they're going. So, yeah. Well, um, you're saying that there's one that is blooming right now, a red tide that, there that is. you're saying. Yeah, not not in my area, but down around Fort Myers. It's, and there's, it's not a coincidence. I mean, it's yeah. exactly where the hurricane impacted the most. Um, and there's sewer line mains broken and, and all the farm runoff coming out of the three rivers down there, the Clusahatchee, the Peace and the Mayaka. And it's all gone into Charlotte Harbor. And then now that the fresh water, you know, red tide doesn't like fresh water. So, mm-hmm. or, or brackish, it needs high salinity. So, now that those salinity levels are coming back up, it's meeting all these nutrients and it's, there's a big red tide going on. It's just mm. kind of starting in the last week down there. Wow. Uh, I'm going there today. Actually, there's a captains for clean oh, yeah. water event, uh, this, this weekend. And so I'm going to go, yeah. go there and check it out. I, um, yeah, I'll, I'll actually, I'll, I'll be down there oh, as good. well. Yeah. Yes. Good. Well, I'll see you. I'll see you this weekend. It'll be yeah. uh, nice to meet in person. Um, sure. so, uh, the, my experience with the hurricanes, we we haven't had the um, the red tide um, after the hurricanes. My experience with the hurricanes has been that um, anything natural has benefited, and anything man made is destroyed. Um, yeah. But the fishing has been very good after a lot of the hurricanes that we've had um, sure. in in the in the Keys. But you know the red tide thing that's a that's a whole different that's a whole different animal that we don't have to deal with any of the sure. freshwater intrusion. In fact, as you know, the problem is that we don't have any freshwater, you know, coming right. into the the Everglades. Um, so even that, you know, a, a, a hurricane can be what seems beneficial. I don't know, sure. um, but it seems yeah, beneficial getting... to get a ton of fresh water to pour into the Everglades. Right. Um, yeah, I know. That's a, a big thing. You know, I was, I went up there to Tallahassee with captains for clean water, uh, what, in January and, that whole thing. So it's like all the fresh water is going out both sides of the state and not getting to the Everglades. And in the last, whatever, especially in the last decade, that the seagrass is dying in, in Florida Bay and things like that because it needs that fresh water and it's not getting it. Yeah. So it's such um, a complicated thing to explain to someone how there's too much fresh water just a short distance away from another area that has zero fresh water. And the problem here is, is super high salinity. And the problem right. over here is that there's way too much fresh water. Like that's, yep. that's a hard <laughs> thing to get your head around when you're not I even know. that familiar with the state of Florida and, and what's going on and how big the Everglades are and what's, what's happening and Lake Okeechobee, the whole, the whole deal. But, sure. but captains for clean water has done a, a very good job of educating people, sure I think have. on, on the, not just, just what the problem is, but also that there are some solutions to right. to the problem. That's what that's what I've enjoyed working with them so much about is that that they are solution based or, or or at least making every attempt that they can be to to be solution based as opposed to just pointing the finger and screaming and yelling, which For sure. you, know, you want to. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like we all want to, but sure. um Anyway, yeah, uh, you know, I just I remember going to just real quick, like going down to the Ten Thousand Islands area when I was fifteen. I mean, that's that was like a trip to change my life. I I loved to fish. <laughs> you know, my when I was a little kid, my dad's not a fisherman. I just kind of loved it. You know, I was always obsessed with it since I was a little kid. But then I went on a guided fishing trip to Ten Thousand Islands with a guy named Scott Hughes. I don't know <laughs> if he's still doing it now or not, but um, we went out of Marco and and went east into into the Everglades. And it just like blew my mind. And that's, that's the day that I decided that, you know, I want to be a professional fishing guide and I want to be one of these guys that's on TV, like Jose Wahebe or you or whatever that I grew up watching. And that's what I want to do someday. But I remember that those grass flats out there were crystal clear, hmm. right? It was yeah. in there and in, in like off by Cape Romano and all that. And the 10,000 islands, you go to the outside, it went from tannic to 
clear and you can see the grass. And now you look at satellite imagery down there and all that grass is either gone or it's really murky, like mm-hmm. the milky kind of water. And that was a, that's a quick change. It was never like that before. Yeah. Just that starvation of fresh water over time is just keeps doing it in. Wow. So that's interesting. That trip, you were 14 years old and, um, did your dad take you on that trip or how did you, how did you end up going on that trip? Yeah. I mean, I probably, I think I probably begged him, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> cause he'd be like, Oh, where do you want to go? You know, maybe it was for, I think it was for my birthday or something. And, um, he's like, what do you want to do for your birthday? I was like, Oh, I want to go on a guided trip. I actually wanted to go to the keys. Uh, I think they decided that was too far. So I just did a little research and not that, I mean, it's not that much closer to get down there. We lived in Orlando at the time. So, um, so I finally, you know, did a little research and picked out an area that I thought would be cool, but you know, this was 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so before the internet had taken off, I didn't really know exactly what we were getting into, but I, I hadn't caught a snook at that time yet. I was, I was bass fisherman and really wanted to catch a snook and, um, caught my first snook on that trip, but just like being in that area where you feel like you're the first person that's ever seen it. Yeah. And just immersed in the, the raw nature of it all, uh, just really like hit home with me that. And I was it just like had an epiphany. It's like, this is what, this is what I want to do. This is my calling. And then from ever there, ever since I was just like laser focused on this is what I want to do. And how did you, how did you kind of direct your, your life towards being able to do that? Did you, <laughs> were your parents supportive of that? Were, yeah. did you yeah. start to think about, what you could do in school to support anything like this? I mean, was there any sort of path that you, that you took or was it just a single minded focus? Well, I mean, so, you know, at first, of course, so I, I, I was actually uh, the youngest person at the Bass Pro Shops in Orlando. That's where I worked. I, I got my job at Bass oh, Pro cool. Shops. Um, so I was the youngest, I was 15 at the time. I was the youngest person they ever hired as a fishing associate. I got like special permission because you're supposed to be 18, I guess. Um, so I was sitting there working behind the fishing counter, you know, all day talking about the newest gear and talking to other fishermen. And like, I learned so much from being at Bass Pro Shops and, you know, then going, um, one of the guys there's, uh, he's, you know, he's, um, a guide over Mosquito Lagoon. And whenever he wanted to do a scouting run, um, we, he would, you know, he saw, I guess, recognize my passion for fishing and we'd go over there and I'd. I'd be on the front of the boat or I'd pull him around over there in Mosquito Lagoon, North Indian River for tail and reds, and the giant trout they had there. And um, that's, you know, fished a lot in the East Coast, up Banana River and Sebastian and all that stuff, just fished all the time. And then, of course, obsessively watched all the shows and read the magazines and did all that. And then um, went to Eckerd College, which is right here in St. Petersburg um, for marine science. Okay. Um and they also, you know, it's kind of funny. I, I took a tour of the campus and, you know, they, they're we're walking around and talking about the dorms and all that stuff. And there's retention ponds on the campus. And I, mm. I saw some mullet jumping out of the, of the retention pond. It's, you know, landlocked. I'm like, hey, I asked the guy, like, what's the deal? Is Why is there a mullet in here? And as soon as I asked him, a tarpon came up and blasted the mullet and the mullet all showered. And I was like, there's tarpon <laughs> on campus. Oh, my God. So that was like, I mean, I wanted to study marine science anyway, but. That was the deciding factor. I could fish for tarpon all day on in between class or whatever. And wow. snow. so that was really cool. Um, but got, you know, got the marine science degree and I had a goal. They asked you when you're a freshman of, you know, where do you see yourself in 10 years? And I said, I wanted to be a professional fishing guide and I want to have my own fishing TV show. And I, I made it happen. I, I was the host of a show on NBC sports for four years and, and on, on the discovery channel as well. Uh, for one year and became a guide kind of fresh out of college. Um, you know, is uh, so made it happen, but I was, I graduated right in the recession. I was so broke, you know, just going from crappy job to crappy job, but still stayed in the industry. Like I was working at marinas or working at a tackle shop. I wanted, I didn't like go work at a bar or do anything like that. Um, just, stayed around it and then eventually met a guy that loved to fish had a boat i told him about myself and then he let me use his boat uh and help me market and become a fishing guide after, you know once i got my captain's license so um that's how i got my start and then just kind of took off from there 
That's and awesome, man. You. That's that's fantastic. I love to hear stories like that about how you, yeah. you know, people just, I have so many people that, that ask, like, how do you become a fishing guide? How do you do this? And basically the, the, the advice is always the same. Like, you just kind of got to do it like yeah. whatever it takes. Like the, your story is perfect. Like you keep knocking around these marinas until finally you get this opportunity and you better be ready right. to take that opportunity and jump. And then yeah, you, you you've done ready. it. Yeah. You've yeah. done it. That's awesome, man. So um, one of the things that I wanted to to talk about uh, just scrolling through your Instagram I mean, man, you have really been around. You have fished all over the world. How how have you been able to do these? Where what what places have you gone? Because the ones that I was the most interested in was Australia. Your recent trip to Australia—that's what I had planned on talking about. But looking back through when I was doing a little research, I mean, man, you have been all over the place. How have you made made it happen with your with your travel? Sure. So, um, well, it kind of goes back to the. The, the first fishing show that I did was where I really started to be able to travel the world and, and do some crazy stuff. Um, and that was only, so I became a guide in like 2010 and all of a sudden in 2012, I became the host of, of North American fisherman television, which was right after bill dance on, uh, on NBC sports. Mm-hmm. It's just like my dream job, you know? Um, and I, it just, I was writing magazine articles for them, just trying to hustle charters. Long story short, they liked what I was writing, sent a camera crew down to have me be their guest host. And then liked how I was on camera and asked me to be their saltwater host for their, for their co-host, I guess. Nice. But they're like, you know, they were on the prime spot like four times a week for six months out of the year on NBC sports. And then I just kind of fell right into it. And I was 26 at the time, like single, whatever. I could just travel on a whim. And um, so they really opened, you know, it was such an amazing opportunity. Uh, Just uh, we went to Mozambique, Africa, Wow. uh, fished on the coast there. Was that for Tarpon? No. So that's on the other side. So it's on inside of Madagascar. It's on the Indian Ocean. Uh, That was the, the first really crazy place that I went was Mozambique. Um, so we float, we fly 16 hours to Johannesburg and then another three hour plane ride to a little tiny town. It's based in the airport. It was like a, a tiny house you go through and then you're in, you're in Mozambique, which is just so crazy. And, uh, but we fished on this, on the coast there and, um, we stayed on top of this, this little compound. It's like a bunch of handmade log houses up on top of a sand dune there looking out over the Indian ocean. So <laughs> it's so crazy there that, that I guess apparently that land hasn't moved like geographically over time at all. So it's prevailing winds have just built this gigantic uh, sandbar that goes up and down the coast. It goes straight up four stories and then straight back down. And then you're in the bush of Africa. Wow. So we were up on top of this giant sandbar looking out over the Indian ocean. There's humpbacks everywhere. And it's tropical there, right? So it's a warm water current coming coming down from the equator. There's giant trevallis. There's all the Indo-Pacific king mackerels and tropical reef groupers and snappers. And a lot of the same stuff that was in uh, Australia, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was like, I was a bit unprepared. I brought, we, we were told we were going to go tiger fishing in the Zambezi River. And we might go to the coast. So we ended up not going to the Zambezi River and we went to the coast. So I brought like bass stuff, maybe like kingfish size stuff, tarpon stuff. And then I brought a 50 wide for marlin and the billfish. I needed something in between the tarpon and the billfish stuff (laughs) because I got my ass kicked by GTs like 10 times a day and other just unstoppable reef fish that would just blast me into the volcanic rock down there and then and just bust me off. So I, I, I hooked 10 GTs a day and didn't catch one while wow. I was there. Wow. So, but I caught all kinds of other stuff. We caught like a 70 pound Indo-Pacific King mackerel, which is, they have like, they're like the Atlantic King mackerel, but they have kind of like tiger stripes on them. Yeah. They're yeah. really cool looking. They yeah. actually, we, they we caught like something that, yeah. Well, they were calling something a Spanish mackerel when I was yeah, they in, call them in Spanish. Yeah, when, I think I caught the same fish when I was in Australia, and they yeah. were saying Spanish mackerel. I was like, oh, "Well, I mean, I don't know if this is going to be great." And then we go out there, and they're like the size oh. of Wahoo, and I was like, "Okay, oh, yeah. this is oh, yeah. not the Spanish mackerel I was 
no. <laughs> getting ready for, but, no, and, and a great right. tasting fish that, that fish oh, man, was amazing yeah. to eat. It was like Wahoo. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's so different. I mean, they look similar body shape to our, what's cool over there is like all the fish are, you recognize what it is, like what family it is based on the fish you catch in here in Florida. Yeah. Right. Eat a little bit, you know, uh-huh. it's like, you're like, Oh, I know what that is, but it's like scoop. And there's a little bit of color change. Maybe it's way bigger or something. Yeah. You know? I noticed the same thing when I went to Australia and we'll talk about your Australia trip here, but we caught, I don't know. I mean, when we went out to the reef and we really got the numbers up, but I think we probably caught close to 50 different species of fish wow. there. And I mean, just what, I mean, all these crazy fish would come up and it's like, well, okay, well, there's another species. I don't even know what it is, but yeah. you know, we just started counting up the numbers of, of fish that we caught. And the only one that was exactly like the, what, what the same species that we catch here was the cobia. I mean, I yeah, looked this right. cobia yeah, up and down and I'm like, okay, there's yeah. no difference here. We call it permit and you're like seeing yep. differences in the nose of the permit and mm-hmm. they're slightly different. You're like, it's, it's the same fish, but you know, it's got some differences here. Yep. Um, the barramundi was very similar to a snook, but different, you know, and like everything was kind of similar, but, but different. And then, yep. except for something like a thread fin salmon or something, which I saw that you caught and yeah. we caught a few of those <laughs> Man, and those were just weird looking like just aren't they so weird i, I guess they have them on the um the west coast of africa where mm. you can catch tarpon and, and like you know it's in the atlantic but we just don't have them on on this side of the world for whatever reason and but man those things fight yeah i don't know yeah. uh, they're, they're such a crazy fish yeah uh, they're, i don't know about you but we i mean we were in the middle of a school of those things for hours and, and it was like unseasonably cold where we were in brisbane and just knocked them over the head with these baits and like couldn't get couldn't get bit for hours then all of a sudden one would hit it like inexplicably wow now, so i didn't have that experience with the thread fin salmon <laughs> um we only ran into a few of them never saw a big school like that and uh you know caught caught a few but that was that was it and then kind of moved on i was so excited about catching different fish down there that the only yeah. thing that we really stuck on was the queen fish and we got into this amazing fishing for queen fish that was, I mean, I, I kind of, I had never seen a queen fish before, yeah. but they look just like our leather jackets, yeah, you know, they they're, they're this big, but the, you know, the queen fish were huge. And I, I just kept catching these fish and I'm like, you know, I've never caught one of these before, but this seems like it's a really big one. Like it just looks very mature and thick and it turns out, uh, we go back to the boat and they had a world record book there and we had weighed a couple and we're like, Oh, like everything we're catching is a record. If we just wow. use the right <laughs> to pound test, like we're in this right. amazing place. So we did yeah. stick on, on, uh, on the queen fish a little bit, but other than that, we would just catch some stuff and move on and, and keep, keep just chugging away at the different species. And it's it was so crazy. What you can amazing. encounter out there and the biodiversity know. is insane. And to go back to Mozambique, so where we were in that region of Mozambique, Jacques Cousteau, the famous naturalist, he he had gone there, the same area, same exact area, and named a bunch of these reefs. And he's quoted as saying that that area of Mozambique is the most biodiverse region of the ocean on Earth is wow. right is right there. Because you have a coastal ecosystem, and then right off the beach, you have this, this volcanic coral reef stuff going on. Uh, and then a few hundred yards off of that, it's 300 feet of water. So within this very short area, you have billfish, you have reef fish, and you have the coastal fish all kind of melding in this little tiny area, which is really That's wild incredible. to think about. So what's crazy that, you know, like we were saying, they they call the the king mackerel or the Spanish mackerel in Australia, they call them kuta there. So there's huh. all these different regional names of the same fish. So the guy was telling me they troll these like a stretch 25, you know, the big grouper plugs that you would troll. They troll them up and down the reef. And he's saying they're catching bonefish on these on these plugs. I'm like, OK, so like what what do you what is it? He's like, oh, it's like a silver fish, whatever it is. They get like 10, 10, 11 kilograms, which is like 22, yeah. 24 pounds. Right. Right. So I'm thinking, OK, so what? So show me a picture. And so show me what you call a bonefish. And it was a bonefish. <laughs> Okay, so the world record is 19 pounds. Yeah. He's showing me pictures of 20 plus pound bonefish they're catching on these trolling plugs inexplicably. Crazy. 
So these are world record bonefish in Mozambique that they catch trolling as, and they keep them, they keep everything there to give to the villagers, but they're catching world record bonefish. And I was just like, I couldn't believe it. That's know? amazing. So that's and something to think about. So is there any place there that you think that they're, they might come into shallow water or is, uh, or is it definitely. a deep water bonefish you think? No, it's, I think there's big sandy shoals. It's not like big grass flats, but there's big sandy shoals. They would probably come up on that are kind of on the beach. And um, there's some river mouths and stuff, but it, it drops off pretty quick. So but, uh, what, what was the, uh, what was the setup like? there what did they are they were they set up for for fishing um and tourism no, was, and stuff or was it pretty no, rough not, not really so i guess the chinese had just come in and built a, high, a freeway system uh when i was there this was in 2012 um but other than that it was dirt roads and basically no infrastructure and so what they do fish so we were with a bunch of guys that were like wealthy landowners from like zimbabwe they, they were farmers right so they had um, big plots of land all over the place. Um, and they had this, this is like their little vacation house in Mozambique it is absolutely gorgeous there. I mean, really, really beautiful. It used to be a Portuguese colony, I guess. So there was all this Portuguese, like colonial buildings everywhere, mm-hmm. but completely run down. And Mozambique is one of the poorest countries in the world. And it was, they had a civil war there like 20 years prior to when we were there, but it was very peaceful. And now it's very peaceful. Uh, and it's kind of where it's where a lot of South Africans go to vacation as well, because it okay. is beautiful, you have beautiful beaches. There's nobody. I mean, we we were driving on the beach for miles and miles and miles and not another person. Um, so absolutely gorgeous. But the way they would fish is they have these little, I want to say maybe 24, 26 foot like catamaran style. It's like a cat. Um style boat and there's no boat ramp mm-hmm. okay so they're they're doing a full beach launch on rollers wow. and what what they do is they go right up to the water there's like a little deep part and like so the water comes around like this makes a little bit of a cove but you're on the beach so there's waves of the indian ocean are coming in and there's a little deeper more tranquil part and they put the the nose of the trailer on the nose of the truck deflate the tires and go 20 miles an hour and slam on the brakes right before they hit the water and the boat flies off the trailer <laughs> and goes into the water with people in it, mind you. So it's insane, right? I thought- How that, do they get it back on? Similar deal? Oh, so to get it back on after the day of fishing, they gun the boat, go full speed. The guys didn't tell me they were going to do this either. They're just like, all right, hold on. We're going to go. We're landing the boat. I'm like, what? And he goes, just like full speed. And just blast up onto the beach as far as you can possibly go. And the motor kick, there's like a special thing. The motor just kicks up and they just slide like 50 yards up onto the beach. And then they they take the the truck and roll it right back onto the rollers and, wow. and take it away. That's how they do it every day. That is awesome. It's crazy. <laughs> That's awesome. I love seeing things like that. We were recently in Alaska and we were up, uh, they, they, they did a similar kind of thing, but they had this big... Russian piece of heavy equipment that I don't know, the tires are like eight feet tall on this thing. And, and, uh, they just put the similar deal, hook the trailer up to the front of the, this thing and just push it out into the water as far as possible. And these are, these are big boats. They're like 30 foot halibut boats. And then when they come in, they've already got the boat and trailer and everything out there and this heavy piece of equipment and they run the boat up there and then it's almost it's almost simultaneous they just pull it right out and they're waves yeah. and there's this one dude there's this there's wow. this one kid that is like in waders and a neoprene jacket and a hood and i mean he might as well be wearing a wetsuit and he's the one that has to hook the boat up to the trailer and he's standing like on the on the the neck of the trailer and or the tongue of the trailer and uh and he's hooking this up and just getting soaking wet and i asked somebody i was like is that how you become a guy do you get that job first and you have to work your way up and they said no man that that job sucks and nobody yeah. wants that job that oh, and i was like well if you pay your dues don't doesn't that, isn't that good and he's like no you don't even want to you don't even want to pay your dues at that job that's the worst job in alaska so <laughs> i don't know what you have to do or why why you would end up with that job but it seemed cold very yeah, cold man. I'm not, I'm not a big cold guy. You know, I like, I mean, so right after Mozambique, you know, we went to like the far North 
in uh in northern quebec up by the mm-hmm. arctic circle and, like fish for atlantic salmon so remote out there um for one of the shows and i like, saw the northern lights and that whole thing nice. um and it was absolutely gorgeous but if i you know usually when i travel somewhere i like to go somewhere tropical um so, you know and then we went to costa rica uh, and tropic like panama a couple of times for tropic star lodge and Cabo san lucas and um i recently went to uh bora bora if you can see all the bora bora stuff yeah tell me about bora bora that's a place that my daughter has wanted to go for some reason she saw pictures on on instagram or somewhere when she was a little girl and she's wanted to go to bora bora for her whole life so yeah what can i catch in bora bora man i'll tell you it is i mean you can't describe how absolutely beautiful it is and and everyone in there is unbelievably friendly like you've never experienced the type of friendliness that these people are it's it's so interesting there so when, when we got off the plane you fly to tahiti first and then you take a little puddle jumper to to the island of bora bora but there's a whole island chain in french polynesia there's different islands bora bora is is one of the most beautiful but it's the other islands also rival it they're just not as famous mm-hmm. because bora bora if you look right here Mm-hmm. Right there, you see it's a big atoll that goes all the way around. There's one entrance right there. So the, the U.S. Navy used it during World War II as a supply area. So there was a big influx of uh, of Americans there for a short time because it's easy to, to, to defend that one entrance. Right. Like yeah. The other ones all have multiple entrances, but they're just as beautiful. There's Raiatea, Taha'a, and there's all these other islands. Um, but so we go there. The first thing I noticed is... So we went, we stumbled into my fiance and I, we stumbled into this market, uh, like just them, like all the local uh, cuisine, they had so many fish and um, and uh, vegetables and, and all this stuff, as well as French cuisine, because it's French Polynesia. So they're still like, they still have a huge French influence. And they're actually under the French government. So they have good healthcare and all these different things, but they, um, the, the, the vegetables there, it was like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. Everything was like the carrots were like this big and like all of these fruits and vegetables are enormous and just like so tasty, right? Everything's got such a good taste. And the reason all these tropical fruits, um, they say that, you know, the, the soil there is so fertile and the growing season is year round, right? It's always like mid seventies at night and mid eighties during the daytime all the time. That's so the weather is like, Perfect all the time. And then you get it's, some rain, probably enough they rain. Get, there's to... a, they get like five days out of the month. It'll get rain during the dry season. And then like eight days out of the month during the wet season. But it's just, you know, intermittent rain. And the way the island is shaped, there's usually cloud cover on the island itself because there, it's, you know, tropical moist air. And it goes up and it rises and then it cools. So it's usually raining right on the top of the island. So it's always raining like you're always like getting water down there to the farms but just they don't need fertilizer so the water's super clear and uh the food was just incredible on top of all the fish you catch in the south pacific and the what's interesting there about the people so i we we actually took a catamaran with a big sailboat around bora bora and then through the other islands which was so such an incredible experience and our captain said that he sailed around the world like three or four times. He said that in French Polynesia and Samoa, the people there will take their shirt off their back and give it to you. And they do not expect anything in return, right? They, like, we went out on a tour with this guy and he's, I, so I told him I was a fisherman. He's like, oh man, I got a boat. Like come fishing with me after the <laughs> tour. And I was like, oh, sure. Like, yes, let's go. And he took us all around Bora Bora. We fished. We had a great time for hours. Burn, he's burning gas. We probably ran fifty miles. And at the end of the day, I'm like, like, give me, let me give you some money, man. Like, let me, let me at least give you some gas money. He was like, no, 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 man. My pleasure. You guys are great. Like, totally my pleasure to take you guys out. Just met the guy, and every single person was like that. That they would do something nice for you, and they did not. That was not transactional. They wouldn't accept money from you. Wow. What our what our captain said was. The reason they're like that is because because the soil is so fertile and because there's so much fish in the ocean that they've grown up. They've always had everything they needed all the time. They never needed to like harvest food for the wintertime and stock up to make sure they could make it through the, the meager times. 
they always had everything they needed all the time. So it's like, oh, you don't have this? Like here, you have, I'll give you this. And then I just go get another one over there. Like no big deal. <laughs> and that's just how they, so that's like a totally, that blew my mind. It's a totally different mentality that, that people have there in that part of the world than they do in any other part of the world. Wow. It's so crazy to think about. Do they have but, coffee there? It seems like a good place. Like the, what you, the way you described the climate there is like a lot, yeah. what, what I saw in Hawaii, like the, 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 the fog goes up there or the, the, the mountain air goes up and then it kind of condenses and it's kind of foggy up on these mountains. That's where yeah. they were growing the, the pineapples and the coffee. Yeah. I think, areas. I mean, they, they grow, I, I know they grow coffee. They're famous for like vanilla and, and oh, but, yeah. I mean, we went around this farm and it was like literally every, every single vegetable that I could possibly think of. They, they had plus all these fruits and, and tropical fruit that I didn't even know what it was. And it just, it was lush and just grew. That's all the time. super so, cool. This is going to be my daughter's favorite podcast I've yeah. ever done. Not that she's ever listened to any of them, but uh, the <laughs> fact that we're talking about Bora Bora and you're getting me super excited to go there oh, one man. day. Uh, yeah. Well, you can see that, that GT right there. We also, I caught my first GT in Bora Bora, right? So going back to not catching them in Mozambique, mm -hmm. I, that was like for 10 years, I was like, I, my GT was like in the back of my mind because I had a taste of it and I didn't get one. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's on the other side of the, you have to go to the other side of the world to get them. It's tropical Indo Pacific to try and catch one. So that's what this whole, you know, this trip was basically about was going to go try and get a GT. So did and, you, did you pack, pack the right gear this time and, uh -huh. and, and you had everything that you needed and, and tell me, tell me, uh, before we get there, uh, you went on this trip with your fiance. So was this some sort of a, uh, a honeymoon trip or was it some sort of a, uh, or was it a straight up fishing trip? Well, so it, so I actually believe it or not, it was, it was kind of plan B, right? So I'd, I try. I wanted to go to this island chain country called Vanuatu, which is even, which is even more remote. Mm -hmm. And I'm planning on going there in September. I think we're going to go. Um, Vanuatu is on as the end of the earth. Basically, there's still tribes in the islands out there, and it's like it's going to be amazing. Um, I, I I still was planning on going to Vanuatu for the longest time, but then COVID hit, and they were completely mm -hmm. shut. They're actually they were shut until January of this, of this year. Um, and I just couldn't wait any longer. I was like, man, I, I gotta, I want to go somewhere. Like I gotta go, you know, we hadn't traveled. I've been to the Bahamas a couple of times during COVID, mm -hmm. which was great, but hadn't like been able to go anywhere. So I wanted to do this, just a big trip to the South Pacific somewhere and French Polynesia opened up and we're like, okay, let's, let's check it out. It looked amazing. And that's, so that's where we went. Um, it was just, you know, a, just a vacation slash fishing trip and, uh, did all this stuff. We, you know, we did the whole over the water bungalow thing that Bora yeah. Bora is famous for. You mm -hmm. see him right yeah. there. That's where we my actually, daughter wants to go, man. Exactly. Uh, right there. Well, it's not cheap to do those things. We did it for a couple nights, but yeah. it, it was really uh, amazing. But, um, I actually caught a fish. So you go in, you're over looking, you're, you're literally over a reef, uh, in some cases. And. We slid, there's a glass table. You can look straight through into the water from your, from your place in, in the one that we had. So you can slide the table back and like feed the fish. I ended up taking a, a jig. Like I had a little bucktail on a spinner and like there were blue, there's blue trevally everywhere, which are beautiful fish, uh -huh. uh, they're all sizes. So there's nice big ones too. And so there were blue, there's a little man-made, like they put, you know, a rock down there and the coral just grew on it right under the, the hut we were staying in. And there are blue trevally swimming all around it, whatever. So I took a bucktail and put it down and like try it's almost impossible to cast in that little area and trying to work this thing around and whatever. And they would come up to it and it wasn't moving enough. But there's a fish called a cornet fish. And I'll, I'll post this on my Instagram soon. I haven't even posted it yet, but it's a it's like a flute fish or like you know, you familiar with those or a trumpet yeah, yeah. fish. Yeah, yeah. Really long, skinny, like mm -hmm. suction feeder fish. It's yeah. probably like four feet long. And so there was one of those sitting down there and it, it sucked the bucktail in. I was like, Oh my God. <laughs> so I reel this thing up and like reel it into our room and the, our nice fancy, you know, hut over in Bora Bora. And like, all of a sudden I've got this four foot long cornet fish that I just caught out of our living room. Like, Oh my God. And I had, I was, she was videotaping it and I pretended like I was going to put it in the bed real quick and she screamed. And then I went outside and, and let it go. 
but it was so we caught a fish out of our bedroom there which is that pretty is sweet. so awesome that's the first <laughs> thing of course that's the first thing i thought of too when my daughter shows me those and says hey one day we've got to go here I'm like i bet we could catch a fish right out of that I mean, it looks like it looks like on a lot of those areas and with the picture that I'm looking at that that maybe there's some flats around, too. I don't know. That's what I figured. I mean, it has it has to. There's bonefish. There's there's uh, the the amount of blue trevallis there is staggering. They're they're everywhere. They're on the outer reefs. They're on the flats. They're like there's blue trevally everywhere, Um, along with all kinds of little groupers and snappers and. There's a whole family of fish called emperor fish that we don't even have that, are, that those things fight hard and, and they're super fun. And, um, but yeah, so we, but you know, we had been on the catamaran for like eight days or something before we went to that resort and the catamaran wasn't, it wasn't that expensive. I mean, it was like six hundred five or 600 bucks for, you have a big catamaran per day, you know, but that's like, by the time you get a hotel and food and all that stuff, you're going to spend more than that probably. Sure. Um, so all inclusive on this beautiful, big, like 55 or 60 foot catamaran. It's just you got, you know, whoever's in your party and then the captain. So he had, it was him and his family. Um, but they, you know, they were great. They stayed, they cooked like five meals a day for us. And we went around Bora Bora and then about a 30 mile run across to these two other islands called Taha'a and Raiatea. And Bora Bora is like, it's relative to many other places. It's not touristy. Like there's no like hawking t-shirts on the mm-hmm. beach or mm-hmm. and that kind of stuff. It's really not like that at all. Um, but you go to the other islands and it's like, there's no tourists. You can't tell that there's, there's like tourism there at all. There's no like fancy resorts it's not that it's not that cheesy like stuff when you go to cancun and mm-hmm. or whatever or like go to panama city beach and that kind of stuff it's not it's not just not like that yeah. um so it was you really felt like you were on an adventure you know and well, it is way out there i mean and it's out there you know, it's out there. that is a but, long but, way to go yeah when we could the cool thing was i could say hey look at that reef edge over there like pull the catamaran at, pull, as close as you can, and I'm going to throw this giant popper and see if we can't get something. You know? They were okay with that, huh? Oh yeah, oh That's yeah. So, so cool. I, I fished all day. That is so cool. <laughs> yeah, I would love to get that information from you. That sounds like sure. a, a trip that we we need to take uh, with my family. But yeah. before we run out of time, I want to talk about Australia too because I've been following <laughs> um, these guys in Australia for a long time on Instagram, the cast magazine guys, Mickey Guthrie. And, uh, I was looking, you know, one of the things I saw when, when I was checking you out was that you had just been with these, these guys and I don't know them. I just know them from Instagram. And I was like, man, I got to find out what it was like fishing with those guys. Cause they look like (laughs) that. I mean, they, they're, they're serious fishermen. They, they, they know what's up. And so where are they based out of, how did you get this trip together and what did, what all did you catch there? Sure. So they're based out of Brisbane, Australia, okay. and they have the company called cast. So I, I brought a couple props with me here. So this is like, this is the lure we were throwing. One of them that we we're throwing in Australia. It's, this for is GTs? one of their lures. Yeah. For GTs and other stuff too. Oh. You know, that's a, that's a 150 gram cast stick bait. And it's like, with the hooks on and everything, it's almost 13, 14 inches long. It's a big bait. You can see it got beat up a little bit right there. This is uh this is one that didn't make it. You can see where the G- <laughs> it looks like a got a hold of it. But the GT is like this was after like nine GTs, one finally busted it off there. That is but, so um, awesome. So, you know, we were so the way I got hooked up with them, I he Ben Ben Jones is the other half of that. He's a GT Buster on on Instagram. And um so he is obsessed with tarpon. Like I'm obsessed with GTs because they don't have them. Right. Mm -hmm. So they don't have tarpon over there. So he's, he started following me on Instagram, seeing all the tarpon stuff I was doing. And uh, they just happened to open, they, they, they're trying to bust into the American market here. Um, So they opened a distribution center in Clearwater. So they reached out to me and wanted me, they saw my stuff. Like, Hey man, we want you to try some of our lures and line and whatever. And the stuff they have is like, it's designed by fishermen, right? Guy, those guys fish all the time and all they use is their own stuff. So it's not like cheap stuff like you see in some of these other brands that like they're just designed 
to be sold and not actually used. Like they put a lot of thought into everything they make, which is lures, uh, line, no joke. They have the best braided line that I've ever used. Like not even close. Hmm. If I highly recommend it. It's, it's got 12 strands rather than eight. Like most of the other brands do that has 12 strands of braid. And it's like 60% of the size of, of the other braids. And unbelievable stuff. But anyway, so that, they wanted me to use their stuff and um, and just, you know, feel it out. It wasn't anything. It was just casual and really liked it and just put, did a few posts here and there on it and built a relationship. And they said, I was like, oh, man, I've always wanted to go to Australia. You know, and they're like, oh, well, I was like, dude, you pay for your plane ticket and we'll take care of the rest. I'm like, OK, done. let's go. Like I ba- barely I've talked to him a few times. I'm like, dude, let's go. Like, so me and the other guy, Ryan, who's the um, American guy re- representing cast there, we went over there, met up with them, had never met him before. And they were so hospitable and just like took us under their wing. And so <laughs> the day that we landed there, 8, 8 p.m., they're like, all right, we have a weather window, 15 hour drive north of here for the next three days. We got to take advantage of it because we don't, <laughs> the, if it's windy there, you can't get out with the reef. So they're like, all right. So we slept for about three hours that night, woke up and drove 15 hours the day that we <laughs> got there. So I was just like, uh, I was so just, and then we we're sleeping on the ground in, in a thing called a swag. I don't know if you're familiar with those mm-hmm. at all. It's just, no. it's a one man tent. It's basically like a, a sleeping bag with a zipper over the top of it. You just sleep on the ground and in Australia. You can just pull over on the side of the road and put the swag out and just sleep on the side of the road anywhere. So we slept in the boat ramp on the ground with animals crawling around and like all this stuff it was noisy boats going in, Tris tried to get some sleep. And then the boats we take out, they were, a, it's a 17 foot sportsman, tiny boat, right? I wouldn't even consider taking that boat offshore, but that's what they do. They, they use these small boats so they can take them on the dirt roads that are way up in like far North Queensland. Uh, they can't drag a 36 foot boat up there like you would want. Right. So they're using these 17 foot sportsmen to go send it a hundred miles offshore. Now is this the, in, you say in Queensland, is that Carpentaria? Um, or is so that the other part of, of, of Australia? North, North Queensland is the horn that goes up, yes. like up the East coast and the farther North, like far North Queensland is the, the tip of the horn. So we were about halfway up Queensland. Queensland is the state. So, um, yeah, it's 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 about I mean it's a pretty big it's a bigger country than you think. It's about the size of the lower 48. Yeah. I'm, so, I'm just checking it out right now to yeah. on on here because yeah. on Queens. So we were up, okay, so this is the same same area that I was. I yeah. went out of Cairns and yeah. then we okay. went we kept flying north which wow, is so like Florida. Up. Yeah, so yeah. there's that Weepa way up there. Yeah, um, and there. we went all the way up almost to Cape York. And then on, on this boat, we got on a boat wow. and then we started uh, going down and there are all these river mouths there. It was the most incredible trip I've oh, ever yeah. taken in my life. But you, you'll you'll agree with this, I'm sure. But that that peninsula that goes up there, that that mm-hmm. Queensland that you're talking about, is it, it's almost exactly the same as Florida is to the United States. Like it hangs out and then there's like all the vegetation is similar, all the yeah. it's it's wild, man. But yeah. so they take these little boats way up there. They do. They they take them on the dirt roads. Like once you get past like town like Cans, which is the last real big, bigger city. There's mm-hmm. a little town called Townsville. And then past that, there's you're in some of the most remote area in the, on the planet. It's okay. very, very wild up there. I agree, it's man. One dirt road that goes all the way up. Listen, take- we flew over that and it got dark and there was not a single <laughs> light anywhere, anywhere. Yeah. And uh, oh. it, it was it was crazy. We were on this we were on this boat, which was amazing and they had skiffs yeah. on the boat and we never so got on a mothership yeah you're we mother- were on a mothership yeah. and i don't even know if they do this trip anymore but it was it was an incredible incredible yeah. deal and we just i mean the the fishing there is oh, it's, it's just so unbelievable crazy. it's so crazy i mean it really is unbelievable it's the amount of nature 
there is just people from the states, even out west and stuff. There's just not as much vast raw nature as there is in Australia. And then you know, we we wanted to go up there, but it was windy like the entire time. So like really windy. They said they said it'll start humping like 30, 40 miles an hour up there at the Cape, the northern tip, and you just can't go for weeks. So you can go all the way up there and then you can't fish. Oh man! So they just watch the windy app and and just like okay, we have a weather window at this part of the coast. We're going to send it up there. So we went out and the 17 foot sportsman's. We slept 60 miles offshore <gasps> on the boat for three days. Oh my God. Yeah. So we take, they took an air mat. We had two different, three different boats actually, but uh, me and Ryan, or sorry, me and Ben in one, and then Nick and Ryan in another. And then, and oops, sorry, cat just jumped down. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but so, so they take these boats out there. We're 60, 70 miles offshore on the Great Barrier Reef. And they lay, you know, I had an air mattress on the front deck, laid over a cooler and also the seat. And then Ben was down on the side of the console, like in a sleeping bag. And the dude, the first night was so uncomfortable. Like we were actually, I forgot my blanket. So I had one little crappy blanket out there that was too small. So I could either pull up and my feet were freezing <laughs> down and my, like this was freezing. And I mean, you're out there, you see the Milky Way and it, but it was a little chilly. I mean, it's just coming into spring there. And there were these birds at like one o'clock in the morning that were doing laps. We're the only piece of anything out there. There's no, we're not on like a sand spit or anything. So there's all these birds that were making all this racket and they'd come in at one, two in the morning and try and land on your head. So you were like one o'clock in the morning, so jet lag, like literally taking birds and like tossing them off of you. It was just ridiculous. And it wake up and beautiful sunrise and then go fish for GTs with those giant plugs and an 18,000 Stella and like the biggest spinning tackle known to man and just blast them as far as you can all day. And whatever hits that is something that you want to catch. Um, wow. you know? So but what was that like? I mean, is the action yeah. there like amazing? You're in these areas yeah. where nobody's fishing, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, we're way out there on these reefs and stuff and the tide is just, I can, I can pull up. I got these, um, I got a few picks here. I'll show you. I don't yeah. know how this is going to pop up on your screen here. It's, I see so, it. You, you see it there? <sighs> yeah. So, so we got, this amazing. is where we slept right here. We slept here. <laughs> wow. So you can, you can see there's a big cut and I could have zoomed out a little bit more, but the current is blasting through there like at like four knots. I mean, it is ripping out there. And so this is the, the Jeep, that's a giant Trevally. So the first day we were there, I got 13 of those mm. wow. one day. In French Polynesia, I got, I got two and I, I was fishing hard, right? I was fishing hard all day. We got 13 GTs. We got the Spanish mackerels. We got coral trout. We got all kinds. This is called a Chinaman right here. That's a crazy uh, reef fish that's all yeah. over the place. It looks kind of like, a, I would say that would be similar to a mutton snapper kind of. Yeah, it's a type of snapper they and have. Then, is that a barramundi? If that's a barramundi, that's the biggest that's barramundi I've ever seen. That is a ginormous bear Monday. Oh my right? God. So just a massive one. And like I got a 50 I pounder. That. Oh, it's bigger than that. 60, that, that 80. I don't even yeah, know how yeah, big that is. 80, it's massive. 80 pound plus bear Monday. But <sighs> so we, this is, that was in an impoundment lake, right? So we, um, we didn't, we didn't actually catch that fish. That fish we found it's alive. We found it floating on the surface when on our, on our way out to the fishing spot, I caught a bunch of bear Mondays, but we um we actually found that fish. I can't take credit for it because that thing's like eight. He said 140 centimeters, which is mm. you know basically four and a half feet. But they're they're Monday are like super deep body, right? Yeah. So that thing is close to 80 80 something pounds. Man. But um he we found him floating on the surface, just kind of laying there, and he he just was like dying of old age. He was just floating on the top. We went and tried to vent him. He was like full of air. We thought somebody had caught him, maybe, but but we would have heard about it. Like mm -hmm. all the guys drinking beer at the at the <laughs> camp, but it's somebody would have been like, "Oh, we caught this monster!" And we just found him floating out there, and we vented him and sent him back down, just like you would with a grouper. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it, but we caught some that were you know nice. They're super fun. I love those bear money. But uh, but yeah, I mean, sleeping out there on the reef was quite an experience in those little tiny boats. Um, and it never got windy on you or anything? What what so would have happened what, if it did get windy? 
if it did, then, I mean, you're just kind of screwed. I mean, <laughs> so, but they, like, they just send it out there in these boats. They're, those boats are small enough that they'll, they ride over the swells yeah. rather than, you know, but that's why they, they're so meticulous about these weather windows. And uh, so we, we fished around that area. They, they brought fuel cans out there and, and that for three days, fished all around. We did some jigging stuff with like slow pitch and, you know, vertical jigs. Um, I had a, 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 so the next one on my list is a dog tooth tuna. We, okay. I've had some close calls. We hooked some in French Polynesia. I had one hit my top water here that missed it in Australia, but that's what I'm going to Venawa to for coming up next, next September. I, I want to check that big doggy off the list. It's an amazing fish. There's a kid from, uh, from Key West that, that I had on the podcast and, uh, he ended up getting stuck in, uh, where was he? Um, is it Tonga? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll have I to look I, it up. I can't believe I'm forgetting where he was, but anyway, he was, he was in the middle of a lot of those and spearfishing. What's, what's his name? Do you um, remember his name? Yeah. Um, I, I think I know who you're talking about. Man, He's I'm, a big spear fisherman, free diver. Yeah. He has his own spear guns. He, yeah, he I, I can't believe, I'm sorry that I'm forgetting, forgetting I know, his I know, name because, I know because he's from Key West and, and yeah. it was a, it was a cool, cool, cool thing. I, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll find it for you. Um, yeah. but anyway, he knows I, I, you should hook up with him cause he knows a lot about that, that. Yeah. Um, yeah. We wanted to have, him. yeah, man, that's, I mean, we're going to, we've, we're going through Fiji. That's where to, he was. He was, he was in yeah. Fiji. Okay. And, so um, in, yeah, there's big ones there. Like yeah, he got stuck there because of COVID and oh, he couldn't leave. Nobody could stuff. come, nobody could go. And he got stuck there for like <laughs> two years and just oh, spear fished the, as much as he wanted sure. to, it was a really, really cool that's um, amazing. podcast there. Yeah, man. Um, that's, Cole, that's, Cole, triple C yeah. Cole. Yes. Yeah, that's that's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. He's a cool guy, man. Really yeah. cool. He's had some amazing experiences over there. Kind of, yeah. kind of similar like to you, like just find yourself in these amazing places. So, sure. um, Australia, super cool. Now yeah, are those man. guys coming over to tarpon fish with you? Yeah. Yeah. So they, you know, we, we were there for almost three weeks. Um, so we fished the reef, we fished our way back down and those, there's a multiple impoundment lakes, like on the way back down to Brisbane, we fished for those bear money. Um, we were going to bot back out to the reef, but the wind was just humping. So we, we went and fished around Brisbane quite a bit and that's where we got that thread from salmon. You saw there, I'll pull it back up real quick. Those are, those are super fun. Um, and then that guy right there, big yeah. giant golden thing those, those i mean those they fight incredibly harder and it's such a crazy fish and um yeah but we we caught some G, more gts and all kinds of crazy fish around brisbane we did some freshwater fishing as well we caught uh went and fished australian bass which was kind of fun um just australian bass is that the australian same as a bass. new guinea bass you think no 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 it's um so australian bass it's a type of perch and yeah. they're a different family than our bass here but they call them australian bass it, it looks just like a little white bass like uh huh. they're they don't get all that big like a whiter hybrid. they're not big they're not that big but man they pull like it's a super fun little fish on light tackle and we're out there you know everything was brand new i'm just checking species off yeah the so probably there's check. another fish that they call a new guinea bass in it yeah actually, that's in new guinea snapper. and i went to uh yeah i went to a, a thing a long time ago it was one of lefty cray's um uh talks when he had gotten back from some crazy trip and he went to new guinea and he was saying that you couldn't you couldn't catch those things not not yeah. the big ones like uh, certainly the tackle that that he took kind of like you like you think you're you're prepared and then you go down there and you're like way undergunned and, yeah i uh, heard it's like a it's like a big kubera snapper yeah that goes that's what it looks like yeah, yeah. And, unbelievable uh yeah, i'd like to do that, that too new guinea is another yeah another place that um would and be would be incredible well, absolutely i mean if you look at new guinea on google earth not only do you have all the rivers and stuff but you start going east mm -hmm. that is the most primal like reef that that some of the most primal reef that there is in the entire world is completely untouched it looks super healthy yeah and, and when you start I'm looking like, at the map uh it's really not that far from where you were like no it's not i mean i got to be like I, I almost wanna, almost like the equivalent of cuba to to florida yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, and that's Vanuatu is very close to that. So we're going to be, we're going to be, you know, getting, getting amongst it there, but 
I want to check off the big blue Napoleon rafts. That's mm-hmm. a big one. That that's like my that and the and the doggies are my next like wherever I have to go to catch those. That's where I want to go. That Napoleon rafts, um, <laughs> those things get you get one so big. No, oh, I did not I get one. Up. But um, so I got stuck in cans, and um, yeah. I was supposed to go to this place called Lizard Island with with yeah. my group, and my plane was late because of a lightning storm in uh i think it was in memphis and that put me late to get to um california and i missed the flight there and the next flight was 24 hours later so my the rest of the party went on over there and they couldn't wait and then the they had to go to lizard island and then i never could catch up with them there was not another wow. there was not another flight to lizard island so i hung out in in cans by myself and went out to the great barrier reef and did all that. But I was going out there and I had a, a Dell Brown permit tournament hat on and I'd kind of gone to Australia with the idea that the fish that I really wanted to catch was this Indo Pacific permit because very yeah. few people had caught both the Atlantic permit and the Indo Pacific permit at the time. So I'm talking to the captain and I'm like, yeah, I'm looking for this fish right here. And I'm pointing at this permit. And he's like, huh, we don't really see those here. And I said, Oh, that's, that's, and this is like a tourist diving operation, right? Yeah, but, I mean, yeah. but, but a tourist diving operation on the great barrier reef is still a pretty sophisticated dive operation. Sure, so sure. I'm, I'm showing the, the, the guy that's going to go with us. And, and he's like, nah, I, I, I don't think he had just, ever, I don't think he had ever paid any attention to him. So yeah. we get there, we stop, we all get in the water and I go down and I'm like, Oh my God. There's a school of permit right there. So I go up and I, I, I show the guide. I'm like, look, this is what I'm talking about right here. And he goes yeah. down and he says, yeah, we don't really see those that often on the reef huh. like this. But there was like 50 of them. And oh, I've got, okay. I still have this video because they videoed, you know, they had a videographer underwater and yeah. you could buy this tape. And I have this video of me swimming with these permit right there. And yeah. it's just a funny little thing because the fish that you go for is the one that, that you see immediately. But I was yeah. looking at these permit. And the reason I'm telling you the story is I'm looking at these permit and I'm turning around to see if I can see the, the, the guide that's with me. And there's a, one of those giant Napoleon rats oh. right behind me. I mean, like the size of a barn door, the, the, ma- the biggest thing I've ever seen. It scared yeah. <laughs> the crap out of me because I thought there was going to be a, you know, a 140 pound dive instructor behind me. And I right. turn around it's and rass. it's this rat that's like the size of, of a, of a barn door. I couldn't believe it. Uh, it it yeah. just scared me to death. No, I hear you. It's uh, I I saw a really big one when I was there too. I I jumped in the water when my when Ben was fighting a GT. I got some underwater footage oh, cool. of him fighting a GT. I kind of floated into a school of bait, which is a little sketchy on the reef. There's so many big sharks and stuff. I was like, screw it. I'm just going to go down there and see what we can see. And there's so much life down there. But he had about a you know big GT on, biggest one of the trip actually. And I went, I swam down with the camera to go get him. And there was a ras down there. It was the size of a door. And I'm like, yeah. oh my God, like that's the one. That's the They're one. totally harmless, apparently. Because I mean, yeah, I told but, the guys, I was like, man, that thing scared me to death. And they were like, oh, that's yeah. like Oscar or whatever. Yeah, He's here right. every time we, st- we stop, you know. It's like, they, okay. They look like, they look like big, just like lumbering giants. But yes. they are fast they yeah they were I, I saw them up on top of the reef like we spooked some some like one day and, and like 50 60 pounders good size ones and they are flying and and they the ben ben and mick were like yeah man those things go hard that's like one of the hardest they're almost impossible to stop because they go right into the reef edges and stuff and they, mm. they're so powerful but so i mean i didn't day, get to see i didn't get to see them go fast but i did oh, man, get to big. see uh the thing it it almost it, it was it almost looked like you were looking through a magnifying glass because it just everything else is like the size of regular fish and then here's this thing that is just yeah. like a whale and <laughs> you're like this is the craziest thing ever and it just yeah. was sitting there just eh, yeah. totally harmless Those you know that's a top two you know the top two on the list they're an endangered species but there's there's lots of reefs where they're they're very plentiful but also in indonesia it's like a delicacy of course in china oh. whatever so they, they just they're harvesting too many and they're slow growing but and all up and down the great barrier reef they're they're completely protected and other countries are protected. So 
there's lots of them in some areas and like none in others where they should be. Hmm. Well, that's uh that's an incredible trip, man. I hope, uh, yeah. I hope you get to go back there. I would love to go. Yeah, man. I mean, we'll see. We, they want to make it a yearly thing. I don't know if my fiance will let me go for three weeks at a time. Just go leave her. I, I didn't bring her on this one. <laughs> so. yeah, I'll tell you what, three <laughs> weeks goals. is a long time to be away anywhere, but sleeping on a 17 foot boat, 60 miles offshore. It's no wonder you were yeah. tired when you got back. So um, when you did get back, you, you recently you caught a, a giant tarpon. Um, yeah, man. So tell me about that's that. Kind of, yeah. That's kind of what I, you know, I've, developed a name for myself guiding over here just being like you know one of the better tarpon guides around and um that's how ben found me you know for from cast and they want to come over and do some tarpon fishing but just real quick they they can't come to the states for a while because they went fishing in sedan so because they're not americans they don't they're not allowed to come to the states without a like they have to they got to go two or three years because they went to the country of Sudan. So they're really blacklisted. Yeah. <laughs> what they just, they they lost their 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 passport. Yeah. If they're if you're an international person, like if you if you're not an American citizen and you go, there's like Sudan, Afghanistan, certain countries. If it, uh, if an Australian goes to Sudan, they can't come to the states for like two or three years. Oh. So they're that's why they they're not they didn't come to ICAST or anything like that. So I think next, um, what is in Sudan that they wanted to go after? The same stuff, like the big GTs and all that kind of stuff. But, huh. uh, but when they come, I'm going to take them tarpon fishing for sure. Um, yeah. That, whatever they want. I mean, that they're, they, they hooked us up so big, like what, I'll take them as many days as they want, but, but anyway, so we, um, so yeah, man, we, back in May, uh, we, we were getting crabs at this local bridge that everybody gets crabs at on one of my charters. It was like May 13th, I think. And it's right. It's a bridge. It's right by my marina. And now it's like blood, the spot's blown up because like everyone knew that we caught it there. And it, it's right in the intercoastal waterway. So there's 30, 40 boats around dipping crabs. Some people are fishing, whatever. Um, and it's it's a brand new bridge, right? So they just built it. There was one there before they tore it down. So the new one's like the spot's been blown up a little bit. But it, so we're, everybody's dipping crabs, and I hear this big explosion, and uh, you know, like a, a big giant splash in the water. And I thought a ray, like, you know, how the, ray, the rays jump out of the water and splash. And I, I was behind me. I looked, I'm like, man, what the heck was that? And as I, I asked one of the other captains that was around, I was like, did you see that? And he goes, yeah, man, that was a massive tarpon just came up and ate a crab. I'm like, okay. So we had one ready to rock, like so crab sitting in a bucket ready to go. And I just like took it and flipped it right in front of the splash, instantly hooked up. The thing like cuts across, it was on the right side of the boat. It cuts across to the left side of the boat, right under the trolling motor. So that was a bit of of fiasco and goes right towards the fender and around the fender. Mm -hmm. So I'm, oh my God, like we had, I never saw the fish. I could never, never saw it. So I just had my guy open the bale, get the trolling motor out. We try and work around which part of the fender the line is around, figure it out. You know, it's around it but not through the bridge, thank God. So it was around this side and we go blasting out, go go chase this thing down and just scream and drag the whole time. Never jumped. The, the fish never jumped one time, which is insane, right? So it's just running and running and running and running. It goes down this whole row of houses with docks and piling and stuff. And I'm telling you, it was two feet away from getting around the pilings. And I'm I'm trying to like coax it out with the boat, just like not piss it off, you know, because if, if you pull too hard, it's going to surge mm-hmm. and then it goes wherever mm-hmm. it wants. I'm just trying to like, uh, just pull it away from the pilings. And eventually it got clear of all that and kind of got out into the open. But I think it was, a, a it was either a Friday or Saturday. There's so much boat traffic everywhere. So the, the fish is getting run over by boats and we're like honking at people and all this stuff. and so we finally settle into the fight kind of out in open water. We're right in the middle of the intercoastal water with lots of boats coming by. And it, we get it to about 50 yards away from the boat. And I'm thinking it's an hour into the fight. And like, I, I put a lot of pressure on the fish. I'm, I'm not one of those guys who likes to fight him for a long time and like let him fight. We never fight a fish for three hours or two and a half hours or anything. We're using heavy tackle like and maxing it out basically. But 45 minutes into the fight, this thing blows a hole in the water. Like I, I thought a bull shark was chasing it, mm. but it wasn't right. Blows a hole in the water and dumps the reel of line 300 yards. 
And this is an hour into the fight when it's supposed to be like getting tired. It it blows a hole in the water and takes off and dumps the entire reel of mm. bypass 300 yards. I mean, it ran on a 300 yard run an hour in. And I was just like, what is happening? Like, what's going on? Here? This is this is insane now. Like, uh, I figured maybe, OK, it's a really strong 180 pounder, like 160 pounder big fish, but I'm not thinking it's anywhere near what it was. So eventually we get it over towards the seawall and we got a big crowd of boats around us now by this time. Still hadn't even it came up and rolled. But, you know, like when they're 100 yards out and they roll, you can't tell how big they are. Right. There's no perspective at all. And we eventually get over to the seawall and it comes up and I see it for the first time. And I just, I could not believe it. I'm like, oh my God, this is like a foot longer than any tarpon that I think, you know, that I thought that I'd ever seen. And just the girth on this thing, I'm like, this is the biggest tarpon I've ever seen. I can't believe this. Right. And I just slowly wear it down. My, my guy, um, he did an awesome job fighting this fish. He never did. Let me touch the rod. Like I never touched the rod and he's probably 150 pounds soaking wet. Hmm. Not he's a, so in his mid twenties, like not, a, not a big dude. Right. So, but he fought that fish really good an hour, 45 minutes uh, with no jumps. And you know how brutal that can be when they don't jump, they just stay down. Right. And we get it in close to the seawall. I decide that, okay, we're getting, we're going to get out with this fish. We're in three feet of water. And I, I landed him in the water. As soon as I grabbed him, he just gave up. It was like the best thing ever. He was good to go. And I could not, we've got these pictures of it. I'll, I'll pull it up right here. So let's see. There's a, there it is right there. That's so you guys see that. Yeah. So, and it, it, this, I mean, look at the size of the tail. On it's this a thing. massive fish. So it measured to 86 inches at the fork of the tail with like a 45 inch girth wow. and and that puts it right around 240 give or take 10 pounds according to the bonefish tarpon trust formula that you use and state record is 244 so it's within range of that record you know hmm. i and wonder where was the previous state record Cause there was a big one like that caught uh, and there's still a sign hanging in Garrison bite. And it was like two forty three or something like that. Called yeah, a coupon I that, bite. Yeah. I think that, I, that might be, that might be the one. And it was so long ago, man. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, that, that, that sign still hangs there. Um, yeah. I think that, I think two forty. it's like two forty three point eight or something. Yeah. It's like, it's right. Right. That's, that's the state record. So this one measured like right there. Right. Wow. And, and I try to take really accurate measurements. The fish, we never brought, took it out of the water or anything. And if you look closely, I don't know if you see my cursor. Yeah. Yeah. So you see it had, it was blind in this dot. You can see wow. it's missing it, missing its lens. Yeah. And it was still like, even with one eye, it was unbelievably like, you can't see the girth on this thing, but it was really a, a big fat girthy fish. And what was interesting, I thought it was, so it was button hooked. The, I use an eight-aught circle hook, and it was hooked straight through. Never chafed the leader, like not even mm -hmm. a little bit. It's it's tough for that big circle hook a lot of times to actually get through. A lot of times it's just kind of sitting in there. Yeah. It's not like yeah. penetrated yeah. through. But this fish was kind of like soft to the touch. Like it it's it those big bony plate. I think it was just old, right? Yeah. So the bones are starting to like wear down a little bit. But the, the fact that it had one eye, I was calling it one eyed Willie to bring, <laughs> just to like mess with people, you know, as a, as a joke and like Florida sportsman ran with it. And then all of a uh, bunch of people wrote articles on about it and called it one eyed Willie, which I thought was funny. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, but so we got out, we took these pictures with it, everybody clapped and whatever. And there's also a bunch of people standing on that seawall behind us, watching us catch this thing. And, um, and let it go. And it, it just shot off like a rocket. I mean, it was like totally like most fish would be like, just kind of whatever in some way, this thing like bolted away and like, it was like nothing had ever happened. It was, wow. it was just an insane fish. What was it like when you grabbed the jaw of that fish? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I, my guy was still fighting it and I jumped out and as soon as I, you know, I, you, dr you grab that front jaw and just try and stop them from going forward. And the fish just kind of like, let me get them, which is really which is weird. But then, and, you know, like the, the biggest fish that I've ever um, been able to handle, 
when you grab that jaw and I'm just looking at this fish's oh, jaw, right. it's just massive. And it's, yeah. you, you obviously have something in your hand that is like, it's, it's like a tarpon's mouth, but it's bigger. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Man. Like just it's like a dragon. It's yeah. Like you're holding a yeah. Dragon. Yeah. You know? I mean, I've never caught a fish that big, not, not anywhere close to that big, but a couple over 200 and sure. you grab a 200 pounder compared to a 100 pounder and the oh, jaw structure good. and the whole head and everything yeah. is just like so much just, bigger. I mean, it's just, it's hard to even they do this, describe. They don't do the like, da, 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 da. it's more like, bah, yes, bah. it's like it's big and it's strength. Gnarly. And strength. you're just holding it differently. Power. You're almost like holding it with your hands out like, yeah. like yeah. this, like, it's just amazing. Yeah. And, and you can't yeah. like, you can grab, grab a, like a, a hundred pounder an 80 pounder by the jaw like that with one hand and, and have a pretty good idea of being able to hold on to him a little bit, but yeah. that, you know, one of those big ones, and I can only imagine that one, it would yeah. be like grabbing, I don't know, like go, grabbing a Goliath grouper's mouth or something, yeah, something I, so I mean, different. You can, you can you see know? like that jaw, that, that jaw bone coming out of his mouth yeah. is almost as big as my neck. I know it's massive. <laughs> massive it would have been i would have been um i mean catching that fish on a rod and reel would be really really super cool obviously a fish of a lifetime but as sure. a guide handling that fish is i mean yeah, to me really that's special, like man. yeah i don't know really man that's what i'm to, to be in the water with the fish it's and that then the, big. the distance between the the front of the jaw and the dorsal fin is yeah I mean, that's like bigger than most tarpon people catch is that, right. that distance right there. And then what's interesting is the distance between the tail and the dorsal. I mean, that's yeah. a, that's still a big, big, big difference. But when a fish gets as big as this one, yeah, it's I mean, longer in the front. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Like there yeah. is length in the front of this fish that is abnormally crazy. Right. And they, it, yeah, the length, the length was what really got me. I mean, and, and you can't see it because it's magnified in the water and stuff, but it was very deep bodied as well. Just, just like unbelievable. And, but the length, when I first saw how long it was, I, mean, I was just like, what? Right. I mean, yeah. it's, it's seven foot two at the fork of the tail is what it measured to you when you close the jaw and like do all that. But you press the tail down, and that's in that's over eight feet, and that's an eight that's foot total. That's incredible, man. Yeah, that's incredible. So, and then a forty-five inch girth, forty-five inch girth. And so the first measurement I took put it at forty-six, and that puts the fish at two sixty. And I was like, man, I I can't, I don't even want to say that. Like, I don't want to say that I caught a two hundred sixty pound fish because you know, when social media will blow up and then be, people would be like, no, it's not da da da. So I took another one and made sure that it was exactly what it said. And it was actually like 40, like a little over 45 on, on the girth. So you, the, once you start adding up even like a 10th of an inch on, when, on the girth, it increases the poundage like oh, yeah. quite a bit. So yeah, you should talk but, to Mike Larkin about what this fish is too. Cause he has a, a another, um, he's like a, a, a scientist that has a different, okay. I've did a, I did a podcast with him and he was, he had a slightly different, um, formula where yeah. he was saying that the, the length times girth divided by 800, um, is really accurate for like a bone fish or something like that. But when yeah. you get to a tarpon, he yeah, had, a, he had a slightly different one and it might be the one that you're working off of, but yeah. I don't even know if I would say poundage i just say man the thing was was yeah, you know seven and a, seven foot two <laughs> with a 45 inch girth like figure right. it out for yourself try to catch one yeah, like that I mean, and that's it, just a massive 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 fish and it's yeah. a crazy thing like you catch that in a place i mean that's a place where obviously there's you're you're catching crabs is that a place that you normally fish or is that like uh, yeah i mean it, it is it's it's uh um, it's a, it's a spot where everybody catches crabs, but it's a really fishy spot. And I I've caught some insane fish there. Um, it's in, it's in from the coast, like three miles to a couple miles, probably. Um, the biggest kingfish that I've ever caught in my life was at this bridge. And it's like a little bridge that drains grass flats. It's not like a, a big open water bridge. We, we got a 44 pound kingfish there What years ago. And Literally three days ago, I, I was out there getting bait 
And a Spanish mackerel was split, was doing this on the surface without his tail. And I'm like right next to the boat. I'm like, what was that? And a mat, the biggest kingfish I've ever seen came up and smoked it. Wow. Like, it had to be a 50 pound king. What and are, what are 50 pound kingfish doing uh, a couple of miles inland? That's, that's what I said in a, in like a little channel. It's not a big channel. It's, really? it's, it's just, it's, it's a crazy, it's very, very fishy. We've caught the biggest gag grouper I've ever caught inshore was right around there. Um, the biggest snook on any of my charters was right there. I caught I caught bigger snook personally on the East coast. Hmm. And now it's, it's all changed a little bit because it's, a, it, it, they tore the old bridge out and they put a new one with less pilings and stuff like that. So it's completely changed the whole dynamic of the spot. But I would say it's, it's a, it's a better spot for tarpon and just not as good for anything else because it's not as much structure. But the tarpon seem to like just really like it. Of course, oh, that everything is a little yeah, that one that one sure did. I mean, we had multiple 10 fish days there and it's it's a crazy spot, man. But yeah, that that fish right there was really, really special. It just uh being able to to get it in and the fact that we didn't see, you know, it never jumped. So I didn't see it until it was right next to the boat. I I I've caught a few, like we caught a 211 last year and we caught a few fish, you know, over 200 pounds. We usually hook a couple over 200 each season. Um, and seeing those really big ones jump is like unbelievable. Yeah. But, uh, just, just being able to get my hands on a fish that's that big, you know, there's not many of those swimming around in the world, even at least not around here, maybe in Africa or, or some other crazy place, but not, not in Florida. There's, there's not too many fish like that. So that's that was such really a big special. Fish. That's and amazing. And be able to get in the water with it. Yeah. A lot yeah. of times you'll catch that fish and you're in the middle of a channel that's way out or or off the beach, you know, a mile out or something. And being able to get out with that fish was, was super cool. Man, that's awesome. So obviously uh, your, your angler looks like he's very excited. Is, is this a guy that has caught a lot of tarpon before or? Oh, so believe it or not, that's his first tarpon. Oh, come on. First tarpon, he, first tarpon he ever, the first tarpon he ever landed. He hooked like three or four, I think he said, but that's the first one he ever landed. So he, he booked, six days or five or six days with me for next year uh tarpon fishing all day tarpon trips which you know it's it's a good good chunk of change right there but he's like so fired up i don't know it's gonna have have a hard time beating that yeah i would uh i'd go snook fishing or or permit fishing or king fishing something other than that because you've done it you're you're Uh, you're at the top it's only down from here I know, I know, but hey, whatever. Yeah, well, you know, that's that's good. Good for him. He's 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 hooked. Uh, well, that's cool, man. Man, dude, you got some crazy stories. You've been some incredible places. This yeah. has been a really really fun conversation. I'd love to do it again uh, sure. with you because I don't think that we even scratched the surface. Um, yeah, man. I mean, I've got all kinds of crazy stories from our travel, my travels everywhere, and. You know, I can, I'm going all over the place with Pelagic now. They're one of them. I'm one of their, like, I'm actually the MC for their tournaments. So we go to Costa Rica and Cabo and I'm like traveling all around the world, fishing for different stuff all the time. And, you know, you never know what you're going to encounter doing. That's like, that's what I crave to do in my life is just go travel and fish and catch as many different species and experience different ecosystems as I can. That's what I'm all about. So well, you're doing you it, that. man. And you, uh, and, and you, you set this in play in motion when you were 14. I think that's the yeah, coolest that's part right. of the whole story really is that you really, you didn't come from a, a fishing family and you, yeah. you set this in motion and, and put, put this as, as your, your goal and, and you're doing it. And that's, that's what fantastic. It. I love, I love yeah. seeing that. That's, uh, I appreciate similar that. to, similar to, to my story as well. Just cool. coming from a, coming from a, a an unlikely background and just just being so determined that you're going to make it happen and you do that's, that's fantastic yeah. and anybody can really yeah yeah i mean right. if, you know if i can do it if i saw the other guys doing it i'm like why can't i do that you know even even not my dad can barely even stand up on a boat much less cast a rod so love him but he just can't he's not a fisherman so start you know started with literally nothing and just made it happen you know do you think um what what's your opinion of of how that uh you know, I would. I'm. I'm sure that for a good portion of your journey here, you thought that's your that's your biggest uh, weakness, or that's that's your biggest uh, challenge. Is that maybe you you know you're looking at other people that that 
Their their dad's a guide. Their uncle's a guide. They they're third generation guides. They lived, they they were brought up in this in this uh, lifestyle. And and I know for myself, for for a long time that seemed like a disadvantage that I didn't come from that. And yeah, I mean, I'm just kind of wondering, like, did somewhere along the line did did that turn into an advantage for you that you right. look at things a little differently than yeah, other people? Hundred percent. I mean. You know, it's all it's all about just having the passion for it. But that that passion and not having that prior experience gives you an untainted perspective of of how to look at things, right? You're not you're not getting a something that's preconceived from your dad or your grandfather about how this is done. You're kind of doing it, you know. It takes a lot of time to go out there and figure it out if you're gonna go do it yourself and time on the water, but you're coming at it from an angle where you're kind of an open book. And you can look at things like, you know, it's the first time uh, you're just looking at it from different perspectives. So maybe the way that everybody else has been doing it for such a long time isn't the best way to do it, even though they all think it is. Right. So you can you can think outside the box a little bit better than somebody that's been doing it for two or three generations. We know there's plenty of awesome fishermen that have been doing it that long. But, you know, you're you can come at it at a new with a new perspective and maybe you know do it a bit differently and discover something that no one's ever seen before right so you can do it that way and 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 just all along the way you take bits and pieces from those guys that have been doing it for a long time and take bits of information that work and some that you may don't and just build it all together into your own into your own thing that's kind of what i did you know yeah i love it i love it well tyler we'll do it again and uh i look forward to meeting you in person uh this weekend and um uh we'll we'll see you there but i'd love to i'd love to have have you back on on uh the podcast to learn some more about what what all you're up to but uh thanks for doing this let people know uh first of all go back to uh your full screen there um go yeah sure and uh let people know how they could get in touch with you or follow you or or uh learn more about what you do yeah, sure, man. So um, my Instagram is probably the easiest way to get in touch with me. Uh, it's it's real easy. If you type in Captain Tyler, I'm the first guy that comes up on Instagram, but it's, it's just Captain underscore Tyler underscore Capella. But like I said, just type in Captain Tyler. I'm the first guy that'll pop up. And then you can see like, I've got a bunch of awesome photos and I basically post every couple of days or every day if we're doing stuff out on the bay here. So you can see exactly, it's like a fishing report almost. Um, so that, and then, um, hit and run fishing charters is my guide business hit and run, uh, phone number 727-421-1051. And, uh, that'll be it. I mean, that, those three things will get you in contact with me. There's, that has my website and all that good stuff on there as well. So, okay. Awesome. Awesome. I appreciate it. All right, Tyler. Thanks, man. And, uh, we'll be back with another awesome guest like Tyler next week. So we'll see you then. See ya. Thank you very much. 